uh, is without doubt the first truly global Centennial Scholars presentation in the almost 30 years of the program's existence. Uh, my name is Dorothy Denberg, and it has been my uh, real pleasure and privilege to work with this year's cohort of 11 Centennial Scholars um, since their sophomore year. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the program, this is um, a very small program for a handful of Barnard students who are selected on the basis of promise um, uh, and potential to do some impressive long-term independent work, um, a prime example of which you will see tonight. Um, Miriam Gleckman Crutt is from Chappaqua, New York. Uh, she's a graduate of Horace Greeley High School. Here at Barnard, she is a joint major in women's studies and human rights. The working uh, title of her senior thesis is Constructing Corrective Rape for South Africa, an Evaluation of Journalistic Discourse Around Gender-Based Violence. Says Miriam, quote, I am interested in how critical feminist theory and quantitative sociological methods might inform meaningful transnational activism, end quote. Exciting uh, hot off the press's news is that Miriam's thesis has been accepted for publication in the spring. A very appropriate response. Uh, in the spring 2014 issue of the Harvard University Kennedy School of Governments, <laughs> LGBTQ Policy Journal. Um, a stellar example of a Barnard woman. Um, among her other activities, she is a runner. She has six half marathons under her belt. It makes me tired just to say it. And she is training for a marathon in February. Uh, she is a, a, um, in her third year as a resident assistant, or RA, for upper class students here in the Barnard residence halls. Um, one of the most wonderful aspects, I think, of the Centennial Scholars Program is that it offers students an opportunity to do serious, intensive work beyond the confines of their major which is how a women's studies major can end up doing a project on environmental degradation and mining. Says Miriam, quote, I got involved in the environmental justice movement after piloting and institutionalizing Under One Sky, a year-round urban environmental justice program for 15 to 17-year-old underserved minority youth from New York. In 2013, Under One Sky received a $50,000 grant from Youth Inc. to start an after-school program and hire full-time staff. Um, after her work with UOS, Miriam had an internship in spring 2013 with U.S. Senator Kristen Gillibrand in her New York office. While working at the Senator's office, Miriam submitted an urgent application to the Department of Labor on behalf of 26 employees of federally funded nuclear facilities who have been physically and financially debilitated by uranium exposure. Ultimately, her passion for environmental justice led her to work last summer in, le in the Legal Resources Center in Cape Town, South Africa, where her major responsibility was to analyze a 600-page environmental and chemical mine closure plan and then draft a legal opinion on the plan in the context of South African of the South African Constitution and three relevant items of legislation. According to Miriam, quote, at its core, the legal opinion forefronts the needs of the socioeconomically and racially marginalized. My LRC internship and research afforded me the opportunity to go on a site visit of the Johannesburg Mines with Mariette Lieferink, CEO of the Federation for Sustainable Environment who will be joining us by Skype tonight, and ultimately inspired my centennial project. Next year, Miriam will be enrolling in the PhD program in sociology at the University of Michigan. She, a small but boisterous and enthusiastic crowd. 
Um, she will spend the months, rather than languish or take time on a beach, she will spend the months between graduation and enrolling at Michigan as an intern at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, on a team that will be working on defining maternal health targets for uh, global sustainable development goals. Um, in all the time that I've known her, Miriam's interests have really been of a piece, social justice, environmental justice, and active participation, whether through research or advocacy. Indeed, the same interests that were evident in her work in the sophomore seminar for Centennial Scholars is a direct um, precursor of this work. The trajectories um, the trajectory of her interest in the PhD in sociology was crystal clear even then. Uh, Miriam's mentors have been Professor Yvette Christian Say, a South African-born poet, novelist, and scholar who teaches in the English and Africana Studies departments here at Barnard, and legal resources attorneys Angela Andrews, Charlene May, and Mandy Muriqua. That too. Um, <laughs> In any case, she won't know that I butchered her name <laughs> if you don't tell her. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Miriam for what um, is really a first in the uh, almost 30 years of this program. Um, we've never had a panel before. When Miriam said she'd like to put a panel together for her project, I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and, um, and how's that going to relate to your project? And we're... What are we doing about the fact that your panelists are in Washington and South Africa? But she, wor she really she worked it all out, and she worked it out quite um, uh, impressively and independently. So uh, for your viewing pleasure, the first panel in the history of the Centennial Scholars Program. <laughs> there really aren't that many of you, but you guys make a lot of noise. <laughs> My name is Lucas Moloto and I'm 42 years old. My family is made up of my son who is 17 years old and is in his final year in high school. There is my mother and father, my two brothers and a sister. I have a partner whom I regard as part of the family. I have two nephews and two nieces. I live in a township called Bergerstown this is a mining uh, located township which is situated about 50 kilometers southwest of Johannesburg. Bakersdale lies in the wonderful Dane Spring catchment area. I work as an environmental activist at a non-profit organization called Federation for Sustainable Environment. In short, we call it FSE. Our communities use borehole water, tap water, and stream water depending on their set of circumstances. Tap water is relatively safe as it is water which is supplied by the authorities. On the other hand, borehole water is ground water, which because of dolomitic structure and contamination contains some heavy metals and uranium. These heavy metals and uranium are also found in stream water, which members of the community ingest and use for domestic purposes, as they live just next to one of the spread stream and dams. The communities also irrigate their crops with this water, and therefore their crops bioaccumulate these heavy metals and uranium which in turn poses a relatively high risk of cancers and other associated illnesses. Thank you all for joining this evening. Thank you to our panelists, Dr. Coleman Adebayo, and our panelists that will be joining us later via Skype, Ms. Mariette Liefering. I also really want to thank 
IMATS and the Barnard facilities and events management, who all did a tremendous job to make this look really professional. And um, I really <laughs> couldn't thank you enough. So that's Jason and Alex have joined us today, but also people that I've worked with along the way include Mario and Caitlin. I also want to thank my um, mentors, Professor Yvette Christianzi is with us here this evening. Um, and also, as, Professor, um, as Dean Denberg mentioned, my three mentors at the Legal Resources Center include Angela Andrews, Charlene May, and Mandy Maradiqua. And lastly, I of course need to thank the Centennial Scholars Program. It's been a complete honor to learn with all of you. Um, thank you, Dean Denberg, for always being listening and accommodating and responding within an hour to every email I've ever sent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also to Catherine McLean, who's here over in the other room, for making all the behind the scenes things happen. It really couldn't happen without her. But I do genuinely mean it when I say to all the scholars here that you are among the brightest women I've ever met in my life. And it's really wonderful to learn alongside you, so thank you. The Centennial Scholars Program afforded me an opportunity to go to South Africa and work at the Legal Resources Center. The Legal Resources Center was established in 1979, the height of apartheid, um, and their aim is to, quote, use the law as an instrument for the vulnerable and marginalized, including poor, homeless, and landless people. The focus areas are broad, including um, ranging from land and rural development to child's rights, environmental justice, housing and local government, women's rights and gender equality, refugees, asylum seekers, social security, and access to justice. I worked in their environmental justice on cases pertaining to extractive industries and labor law. This evening I will present, to you, or I'll walk you through really, a site visit that I took as an LRC representative to a mine dump outside Johannesburg. In essence, I'll outline the issues. I'll then turn to some professor, professionals in the field and ask what now? what has been done, and what, what might be done better in future. And then I'll open for Q&A. Throughout this evening, there'll be three main themes that are gonna be popping up. The first of those themes is South Africa's resource curse. So South Africa's tremendously resource rich, and unfortunately that means that high economic incentives for companies and for governments perverse or complicate efforts to regulate the mining industry. Second, Uncertainty is not on our side. There's a lot we don't know about the effects that mining has ha have had and will have in future on health and environment. But what we do know suggests that that which we don't is not good. Finally, it's injury to injury for human populations. So those who are adversely affected by the mining industry are not those reaping the financial and material benefits of mining activities. This presentation will make the argument that poorly regulated mining practice reiterate disadvantage for socioeconomically and racially marginalized persons in South Africa. One might rightly ask, why here? Why me? Why you? My answer is threefold. So firstly, to offer visibility to organizations that are doing tremendous work in this area. The first being the No Fear Coalition, which um, Marsha heads and the second being the Federation for Sustainable Environment of South Africa, which is Marriott's organization. The second is to foster research, research interest. So this is a tremendously interdisciplinary um, venture or area, and we want to get Barnard students, we meaning Marsha and I want to get Barnard students interested and invested in doing research from the Africana Studies Department, from the Chemistry Department, from the Environmental Science Department, and that might sound ambitious, but We've, it's happened before, so <laughs> more on that later. Last is to raise awareness, but I mean that very specifically. I mean raise awareness about some of the adverse environmental and health effects of some of our most ubiquitous technologies. So uh, South Africa has some of the world's highest reserves of gold, diamonds, titanium, manganese, vanadium, coal, and iron. This evening we're going to be focusing mostly on gold and vanadium. Um, gold has long since been a, 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 in high demand. We know it to be used in jewelry, but it's also necessary to be used in laptops, electronic connectors, cell phones, GPS units, and televisions. 
Vanadium, on the other hand, most of us haven't heard of, and that's because it's in relatively new demand. But it's used in most of our newer technologies, including cars, it's necessary to build airplanes, televisions, bridges, batteries, cell phones, light bulbs, what have you. And South Africa has some of the largest reserves in the world of these two very important minerals. So here's an amazing statistic. A third of the gold mined in human history came out of South Africa. And it currently houses 45% of the world's vernadium reserves. So to try and make those numbers a little bit more accessible, I've come up with this. In 2012, the world created 1.7 billion cell phones. And while the cell phones use a relatively small amount of gold and vernadium, the aggregate demand is quite massive. So the US Geological Sur um, Survey estimates that each, each cell phone uses 0 0.03 grams of gold. That's 75,000 pounds of gold every year just to produce cell phones. It's also estimated that each cell phone uses between 0 0.01 and 0 0.062 grams of vernadium, or between 2,000 and 140,000 pounds of vernadium every year just to produce cell phones. So cell phone production can offer a glimpse into the quantity of demand for, these, uh, for vernadium and gold, and that's going to provide a really important backdrop for understanding some of these social and environmental complexities that I'll explain later in my presentation. Today, 1.6 million South Africans currently live on or adjacent to radioactive mine dumps. To put that number in perspective for you, that's roughly the combined population of Boston, Seattle, and Miami. This evening, as I mentioned, I'm going to be going with you on this site visit, and I remember the first time that I went on the site visit myself, and I was learning that the soil I was standing on was 15 times more radioactive than normal and that that soil could become dust that would come into my lungs, get into my alveoli, and stay in my body for the rest of my life. And I remember thinking, like, my, my skin was burning. <laughs> but as I think back on that moment now, I realized that my skin wasn't burning because of radioactivity. My skin was burning because I was angry. I was angry that governments and corporations and naive consumers like myself could benefit from the suffering and repeated exploitation of others. I am angry that such a physiologically and emotionally degrading circumstance is possible, and I'm angry that it's not an international outrage. Before I get into some of the more technical parts of my presentation, I should give you some geographical context. South Africa is at the very southern tip of Africa. And I did a site visit out to Johannesburg, where the, um, out, sorry, out to south of Johannesburg, where the Blue Dot is, which is the Visvaltestrand mine basin. That's where a lot of gold mining takes place. And later, when we talked to Marsha about vernadium mining, she did a site visit to Brits, South Africa, which is the Red Dot. The first environmental issue that I want to speak with you about this evening is called palings. So when, you, when a mining company goes to extract a particular industry, um, material. They dig deep in the earth, for one thing, but in inadvertently and in the process come up with a lot of other extra excess materials. So those can be radioactive, naturally occurring radioactive materials. Those can be chemicals, those can be metals, what have you. Um, and so when those are brought up to the surface, they're left on the side of mining activities. So this is an active mine site. This was gold mining happening, and these, this is the, uh, the pile of tailings that's next to it. Gold mining is often associated with arsenic, zinc, copper, lead, mercury, and uranium tailings, which are likely what are featured in this photograph. As I mentioned, the estimated damage in this area is 15 times more radioactive than normal, so that gives you a sense of how bad it is. Chris Bugsby, who's the British specialist who did the, 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 did the 15 times research, did the research on the 15 times, um, suggested that townships in the area evacuate, and I quote, as soon as possible. That was in 2011. And this is one of the first times where we start to see that uncertainty is not on our side. So here we see that um, certain activists argue, or will tell you, that traces of South African mine dust have been found in Tanzania, which is 2,500 miles away from the Visvaltestrand mine region. But we don't know if communities further away than Tanzania are also affected by the dust, and we don't know if their intermediary communities you know, um, might have environmental degradation or human degradation. So here we see that uncertainty is not on our side, but what we do know is that the dust has traveled, and what we do know 
is that it's 15 times more radioactive than normal. So what we do know suggests that what we don't is not good. Subsequent to tailings is something called acid mine drainage. So if, a, if groundwater or rainwater picks up some of that, um, some of that toxic soil, it can, become, it can increase the acidity of the water, and if that soil is radioactive, it can make that water radioactive. This is mine sludge. Obviously, such mineral-rich waters poses problems for ecosystems, for wildlife, for human health, and for food crops. Um, the, oh, I did want to tell you, the, the water in this photo is treated with lime, so the heavy metals have dropped out, which is why it looks so gross. I'll explain what that, what that means in a second. The volume of contaminated water is, ru is roughly equivalent to 10%, sorry, just in South Africa, is roughly equivalent to 10% of the potable or drinkable water for all of Gauteng, which is the province within which South Africa is located. 25% of South Africa's population, an estimated, one point, um, an estimated 12 million people live in Gauteng. So this problem is a problem for many, many people. But it also is not so easy to fix. So the, it's estimated that the ratio of cl clean to contaminated water is roughly 10 to 1. It takes 10 liters of clean water to purify one liter of, of contaminated water, which points to some of the complexity about remediating this issue, right? You would need a long-term and fairly radical conservation effort. First, you need to stop acid mine drainage where it started, which means stopping a lot of the mining industry. Then you would need to hold back a, you know, a large amount of water from a lot of people over a long period of time, which is of course not easy and points to some of the complexities of remediating. The area um, that I was in the Viswaltestrand region was tested to have high levels of uranium, copper, cobalt, arsenic, aluminum, and manganese. This water is unnaturally blue. I don't know if you can see it in this photo, but it's unnaturally blue because nothing's living in it. There's no fish, there's no tadpoles, there's no lily pads, there's no bacteria, there's nothing living in it. Um, and you can see there's a small sign here that indicates that you probably shouldn't drink the water. I highlight uranium here to transition into talking about some of the health effects. So uranium and its compounds pose some of the most problematic um, health effects for human populations living in the area. So one can ingest uranium by drinking radioactive, by drinking contaminated water, or by eating food crops that have been planted near contaminated water sources. Some of the problems associated with that, physiological problems associated with that, include nephrotoxicity, skin lesions, seizures, genotoxicity, and subsequently various physiological and cognitive deformations. And one that's most frightening to me is bioaccumulation in the bone marrow. So that means that uranium um, compound, high, like exposure to high uranium compounds can have it pose an intergenerational threat. So uranium and its compounds can store in your bone marrow, which is where your blood regenerates, and then your children will be born with blood that has been contaminated. The big one here is radon poisoning, um, which can pose children at risk of lung cancer, can put children at risk of lung cancer. Next is inhaling uranium compounds. So if the toxic dust gets swept up in the air and you breathe it in and it gets stuck in your alveoli, as I was describing earlier, it can pose a significant um, risk of, radio of chronic radiotoxicity, silicosis, fibrosis, and lung cancer. As, I was ex um, as Mariette was explaining this blue water to me, I noticed a, a small group of men walking down towards the water's edge. And I, she was telling me what it was doing to your body, so I started freaking out and I started like waving at them quite frantically. And you know, it was very clear that no communication was going to be made. They thought I was crazy, um, and so I, I gave up. But I, I later went and asked Marietta about cancer statistics in the area, and this is an amazing quote. She explained to me that it is almost impossible to find comprehensive data that directly links certain health problems with dust from specific sources of activities such as mining. The government simply does not collect statistics on cancer in the region. We do not know the health effects of mining. And again, what we do know suggests that uncertainty is not on our side. As I was working at a law clinic, I understood this issue in terms of the South African Constitution. So some items of, of the South African Constitution that I see to be relevant here include the right to a safe and secure environment, the right to water, the right to food, adequate housing, 
equality, dignity, life, and control over the body. I, as, as Dean Denberg mentioned in her introduction, I was also working with three relevant items of legislation, the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, the National Water Act, and the National Environmental Management Act, NEMA. I'll spare you the details. But one guideline that I did find particularly uh, representative, if you will, of what I saw to be a disconnection between promise in law and what was a re re real lived experience um, is this one. So the Department of Mineral Resources has a guideline that says no human settlement can be built within 500 meters or 1,640 feet of, of a radioactive tested site. And as you can see in this image, that's the government line at the bottom of the mine site, and, and settlements are built up right against it. So these settlements have no floors. These people are literally building their food in radioactive, in radioactive soil. It poses a tremendous threat to human health and human life and human rights. And it is in gross violation of what's promised in law. One might rightly ask here, if this is such an awful circumstance, such an awful occurrence, why is nobody doing anything about it? And I think some of that comes down to capacity. So here's a, a snapshot. In Mapumalanga, which is a, um, a mining district, there's approximately 172 registered mines. And those mines hire 7, 72,000 people. And for those 72,000 people, the Department of Mineral Resources has 14 health and safety inspectors. That's roughly one health and safety inspector to 5,143 employees. It's, not, it's no wonder that it's impossible to, to regulate this industry when you look at it that way. So I've outlined the issue, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I've given you a, a fair snapshot of what this is, and I'm now going to turn to professionals in the area, to Dr. Coleman Adebayo and to Ms. Mariette Lee Frank, to ask what now. You're going to have to hold on a moment while I Skype in Mariette. Thank you for joining us this evening, Mariette. How are you? Well, thank you. <laughs> can, you hear, can you hear me when I speak into the microphone? Yes, I can hear you well. Yes? I Excellent. can hear you. Excellent. Um, the first question I'm going to ask is to Ms. Coleman Adebayo. Mariette, I've just given them a briefing on the site visit you took me to the gold mines outside Johannesburg. And now I'm going to have Mariette explain, um, Marcia explain a bit about vernadium mining in South Africa. Hi, good evening. Oh. Is this on? Do, you, do I need it? Yeah. Okay, I do. Okay, great. Um, first of all, let me just applaud um, Miriam's work. This is absolutely amazing. Um, please help me thank her because this is. Thank you. About six or seven years ago, Barnard was kind enough to send a delegation of students and professors to South Africa uh, to study vanadium pentoxide poisoning. And, you know, I just have to thank uh, Barnard again because it meant everything to the community that we went to, um, that people who they didn't even know, who knew nothing really that much about vanadium pentoxide, had left the United States and had, come, had gone to South Africa to study. And it talks about the connectivity of human societies, um, that we really are um, the first responders to each other. Um, and so I really wanted to thank Dr. Dorothy Denberg, uh, because without her, the trip never would have taken place. Um, so she, was, she provided the leadership, and she provided so much um, support uh, for our trip to South Africa that I really just have to applaud her. 
um, Diane Dietrich, who has been um, my fellow warrior uh, in this battle uh, for the last so many years. So grateful to her and Dr. Judith Shapiro and Tim, Dr. Tim Halpin Haley and the four Barnett women. Um, we really, in many ways, um, brought hope um, and perhaps some glimmer of, of, of possibilities to the South African community. Just to give you a very brief background, uh, I worked um, at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and it was my job uh, to, at the, at the onset of the Nelson Mandela government, I was asked if I would represent the EPA via the White House to the Nelson, to the Nelson Mandela government. And my job was to work with the Department of Environment and Tourism mm -hmm. um, to help them create an environment that met the needs of the people in South Africa, as opposed to um, the apartheid, in, quote unquote, environment department that basically focused on the national parks in South Africa. So it was an incredible opportunity, particularly since I was an anti-apartheid activist and I was one of the women who marched in front of the South African Embassy for two years, demanding the release of Nelson Mandela. So I literally went from being a street activist, although you know I'm a scientist, but I went from <laughs> being, which I think is perfect, is the practice and um, the academics, but being someone who, who literally fought in the streets uh, for freedom in South Africa to sitting at the table with the Mandela government. But in the process, of working through this White House initiative, I found out um, that a, a U.S. multinational corporation, namely Union Carbide, um, was poisoning a community through its mining practices. And you've done a fabulous job in terms of showing how some of these processes work, that they were poisoning this community in South Africa. And as she said, vanadium is, is crucial to the U.S. economy. Um, it is the substance that we combine with steel that gives steel its flexibility. And so, um, so for, I mean, the simplest example is, you know, a spoon that you can use for ice cream can also be used in hot soup, and it won't crack. And it's because of the expansive properties of vanadium that, that allows it to expand and contract. Same with airplanes and refrigerators and cars. Um, the CIA says that vanadium is worthy of U.S. military intervention should a, should a government decide to withhold that substance from us, which is, by the way, another reason why the South African government may not provide statistics and why there's that conflict between corporate interest and government interest. In terms of health effects, when I got to South Africa, I was informed about this horrible situation. And I was told, in terms of health effects and symptomology, um, within three months of men working in a vanadium mine, they're essentially uh, impotent. Um, and that causes, obviously, not only a number of health problems, but also social and family issues as well. Um, they also begin to develop um, um, bleeding disorders. Um, they bleed from every orifice in the body. Um, they urinate blood, they defecate blood. There's blood coming out of the eyes and ears. They literally bleed. Um, they also developed a number of cancers, and it's almost the same cancers as you described. They're also um, a result of vanadium pentoxide um, exposure. And when I went on my first trip to a vanadium pentoxide uh, mine, I also started bleeding. Mm. So I'm not sure that the burning was simply because you were angry. It's also because you were being exposed mm. to a lot of different chemicals. Um, so these are very serious problems, and of course, when I came back and told my government, um, the White House and EPA, um, about what I was hearing from my counterparts in South Africa, I was given a direct order to shut up and to look the other way. And I decided not to do that and made the decision that I was going to blow the whistle. And so I blew the whistle on Union Carbide and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And I wrote a book about it, which is called No Fear. So I hope all of you will get the book and read it, uh, <laughs> because I think it's an important work. It folk, there are three or four chapters on Barnard in that book because of the extensive work that the Barnard community did. Um, may, perhaps I should stop there and we should. I'm gonna, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Marietta, question for you. 
Might you describe some civil society efforts to remedy environmental and health effects of poorly regulated mining? For instance, what are some of the Federation's greatest accomplishments? And does the Federation work alongside any other civil society organizations? Ooh. Mariette, one moment, we're having some trouble with the sound. Thank you for your patience, Mariette. So you all know it's about 1.30 in the morning in Johannesburg, so she's being tremendously kind to join us this evening. Can you try speaking, Mariette? working before. Yep. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, there it is. It's is there a connection? I can Mariette, is your daughter with you? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't, I can't hear you, but just um, if she is, could you have her double check if you might have accidentally muted it on your end? One more shot, I believe in you. We're going to try calling you back. Hey. <laughs> Is that her? I can't see because I'm not looking. Yeah. Hello? Oh. Hi. Hello, Maria. Do, do you remember my question? Are you able to hear it? Uh, I will answer. I don't hear you very well, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I was more than 120 years of gold mining activity in South Africa. More than 120 years of has created the largest gold and uranium mining uh, compartment that is buried or underground basin in the world. And that basin is now full or flooded with acid mine water. Uh, the uh, Federation for the Sustainable Environment has raised concerns for more than a decade regarding the impact of the acid mine water on ecosystems and also on human health. Um, acid mine water is considered as a perhaps of the most costly social economic and environmental impact. And in the South African context, mining waste is seen, uh, and especially gold mining waste, as perhaps second to the um, environmental risk. It's in fact classified by the European Environmental Bureau and the United States Environmental Protection Agency as the second greatest environmental risk next to global warming. For that reason, the big market grand gold fields is a significant risk because acid mine water as well as mining waste can uh, cause irreversible damage uh, to ecosystems. The, um, the fact is also that during the 120 years of mining, the mines have dumped the uraniferous waste because gold ore also contains uranium. As perhaps the listeners may know, uranium is both chemically toxic and also radioactive. So these savings 
Hemd und mein Dampf, 270 of them, von kein approximately 600 thousand tons of uranium. It also contains broken tons of iron pyrite tailings, and these iron pyrite tailings, if it combines with oxygen, it produces acid mine water. Tailings dams or mine dams cannot be maintained in an oxygen free or reducing environment. So every time it rains, it will produce acid mine water, and this will continue. Besides that, the mine, uh, uh, mining activities over 120 years has also resulted in thousands of degraded land or bad land and 380 radioactive mine residue areas. Now, there are more than 1.6 million people living on top of these radioactive mine residue areas or adjacent to these mine residue areas. Besides that, as mine drives for more than 10 years, the into river systems and also into receptor dams has resulted in devastating consequences. I propose that the exposure to acid mine draining may result in impairment of cognitive function, in cancers, in confusion, and it may also affect the neural development of the future. Acid mine drain contains about 60% of your metal and toxic metals of the metals such as the metalloid arsenic, copper, cobalt, uh, zinc, as well as cadmium, and then also the progeny of uranium, such as radium. Now, with regards to the successes of the FSE, that is the Federation for the Sustainable Environment, the government has uh, uh, recognized after many, many years of denial, suppression of evidence, or minimizing of the impact that acid mine drain is indeed an emergency. And so in August 2012, after more than 10 years of uncontrolled, untreated acid mine drain, it then declared a, 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 a state of emergency and it started to neutralize the acid mine water. I may just also get that the acid mine water that has been uh, decanted has also resulted in certain dams becoming declared radioactive dams. For example, the Robinson Lake, which was uh, historically a recreational dam, when the acid mine water was disposed into the Robinson Lake, it caused the uranium level in the Robinson Lake to become dissipated 40,000 times higher than uranium in natural water. It also resulted in certain river systems, such as the Swirlis Strait, becoming a displayed radioactive light, and it wiped out most of the aquatic uh, I also may mention that there has been no epidemiological studies done, or even toxicological studies done, in order to determine that the retrogenic, the mutagenetic, or the estrogenetic impacts upon communities. In the Swirlis Right, that is one of the river systems, more than 11,491 persons are dependent solely on that water for irrigation, for watering of their crops, uh, as well as the cattle, and also for drinking. Thank you. Congratulations to FS. Oh. This applause says congratulations to FSE for getting the um, for getting it recognized as a state of emergency. That's tremendous, Mariette. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Marcia. <laughs> You're going to jump back and forth. Um, Marcia, you've you have also been involved in efforts to remediate an aspect of this situation. Only you came at it through the United States government. And you described a bit of this, but maybe you could tell us a little more about the Gorma Becky Commission, your role in the commission, its aims, and how this experience led to your involvement in vanadium mining. Well, as I said, it, you know, I was the um, EPA representative to the White House, um, to the Gore, to, uh, to South African government. And I think one of the first um, interesting parts about the Gorma Becky Commission, first of all, the Gorma Becky Commission 
was a binational commission between the United States and South Africa. It was the flagship foreign policy vehicle between the United States and South Africa. So almost all of our binational relationships uh, between the United States and South Africa occurred through the Gore and Becky Commission, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that we had um, uh, people working on various, um, U.S. officials working on various issues such as public health or agriculture or crime or terrorism. It was just my particular expertise is in environmental science, and so um, I was working through the environmental um, aspects of this. And I think what was very telling from the very beginning was uh, in terms of the civil society um, constituents um, who were a part of the commission, and perhaps that should have given me the biggest clue from the very beginning that something was just maybe not so right. Um, because when I received the names of, of the uh, um, corporations that were going to work with me um, as a part of civil society, it was like Dow Chemical, um, IBM, Ford Motor Company, um, all the co many of the corporations that had had a hand in supporting and, um, and, and securing apartheid stay in place. Um, and when I started asking questions, of course, like why um, didn't we have representatives, for example, from Transafrica, that was an anti-apartheid organization, you know, I was just told, well, you know, we made a decision that we wanted to go, quote unquote, with the big boys. Uh, and so the big boys in that case were the multinational corporations. Um, and I think that really in many ways um, speaks to the limitations of government. Um, which is one of the reasons why I came to Barnet, I think, was because when you have a, a government that has such close relationships with corporations, there's a conflict of interest um, oftentimes between what is um, right for the environment, what's good in terms of human rights and environmental justice, um, and on the opposite side, what benefits corporations in terms of their bottom line. So I think in the terms of the Gore and Becky Commission, what I would argue, it was because of the conflict of interest between um, their corporate sponsors and sort of doing the right thing by the people of South Africa, which is what the Gore and Becky Commission was supposed to do. It was supposed to assist the Nelson Mandela government to transition from apartheid to democracy. But because of our own um, internal conflicts between um, satisfying the, the demands and the needs of U.S. corporations versus trying to um, really uh, work with the Nelson Man gov Mandela government um, in a very um, straightforward way, um, that it made it in many ways impossible for the government to really succeed at what we were trying to do. Um, when we tried to sort of move um, uh, the commission to a place where we were really talking about environmental protection and closing down some of the mines. Of course, corporations like Union Carbide and other U.S. interests that have concerns in those countries would, of course, send their lobbyists to Washington to talk to various people in power, and then we would receive pushback on that, um, which is the reason why I think it's so important for students to get involved in this issue, because we are really um, going to be the front line in terms of helping South Africa and other communities um, that we've been talking about today really fight against these kinds of environmental problems and really um, support communities. Because I think to a large extent government, because of its conflicts again, is not in a position to really push these issues forward. But as, as civil society, um, because we don't have those conflicts, we're in a position to work with communities in South Africa and begin to put pressure on our government to do the right thing. Thank you. Um, because we are a little bit tight on time, and I want to make sure that there's a little bit of time for Q&A, does anybody have any questions that they might ask to Marietta or to Marsha? Mm, Julia. Maria, could you hear that? I, I didn't 
hear as well that I've taken the repeated question from me? She's wondering how environment fits into South African context. How the environment? And, and um, South African politics. How, how the environment fits into South African politics. Is there effort on the part of the South African government to remedy the situation or people? I, I hope I understand the question correctly. I don't hear very well. Um, uh, uh, with regards to the South African constitution, the Bill of Rights enshrined the right to an environment that is not harmful to health and well-being. It also enshrines the right to sufficient water, the right to life, the right to dignity. All of these rights interlink with the right to an environment that is not harmful to health and well-being. Uh, is that the question? Do I answer the question? Are, are, yeah, are there efforts on the part of civil society in South Africa to help remedy the situation? Yes, uh, civil society is very active. There is a very active uh, citizen, citizenry. And in fact, the South African government also recognized the very important role that civil society should play. Just to give you an example, in terms of our National Water Act, the, the, the chapter 7 of the National Water Act states that there should be active local community involvement in decision making. So the, the South African government has the policy of a participatory democracy, but often with regards to mining activities, because mining obviously has a, almost has a superiority with regards to any other development in South Africa, because it creates jobs, it, uh, it also creates economic growth, and for that reason, often when mining takes place, a community may be consulted, but not necessarily uh, involved in decision making. And so we find often that when mining takes place, communities are excluded from that decision making. I think I may also just mention here that uh, Anglo-American made a statement in 2002 that said that it is unacceptable for mining communities when they move on to leave gaping holes in the ground, polluted rivers, and also unenriched and disrupted communities. Unfortunately, this is exactly what we've seen. We find often that they are very ill-informed, disrupted communities, disempowered and boisterous communities, also unenriched, living adjacent to some of the rest of the mine. Thank you. Yeah, I would also add to that that um, in the community that we're working in, in Brit South Africa, there's almost an 80% unemployment rate. Um, and so when you ask the question, why are people putting their lives at risk to go into the mines? First of all, mining tends to be an intergenerational activity, whether you're in West Virginia or you're in South Africa. Grandfathers bring their, their, their sons aboard and their sons bring their sons aboard. So it tends to be intergenerational. Um, but when you have such a poor community, um, and as Marion's uh, presentation indicated, um, miners receive such a small amount of money from a fairly um, wealthy industry. So people are sort of forced to mine. And of course, that brings out political issues and political struggle. And as you saw about two years ago, where the South African government put down a demonstration in South Africa of miners, and about 40 miners, I believe, were killed. That was, I think that was a year. Yes, that was about 40 miners two years ago. About maybe, maybe more than 40. More than 40 miners were were murdered. Um, and so there, um, there are real consequences for political activities in South Africa when it comes to mining. And I know that there was also a mine, there was also a strike at a vanadium mine for, um, for more money. They wanted to increase their salary by a couple of dollars. Uh, the average um, wage earner of a, in a vanadium mine is about, uh, I think, $7 an hour. Um, and they wanted to increase their salary to, to $8 an hour, and so they went on strike. Also, the mine owners had told them that milk um, could have a, a, an impact, could, could positively impact their exposure to uh, vanadium, that it would protect them from the vanadium dust. And so they, they were also asking for a little carton of milk every day uh, to protect them from the dust. 
Um, and of course, the mine, the mine owners, Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut, um, said no, that they just simply would not um, heed those demands. And the miners went on strike. And uh, about two or 300 miners were fired from that mine. And when you're fired and you're living in a community where there's 80% unemployment, um, you're in a very, very, very difficult um, economic situation. What I have found encouraging, however, is the level of political activism uh, in the mining field. It's, it's an incredible, because mining is such an important part of, of uh, South Africa's economy, almost everyone has someone in their family who is in the mining um, profession. Um, and I have been really impressed with just the level of activism, the writing, and the, um, the community outreach, and, and the encouragement of miners to go on strike, if not go on strike, at least to find medical attention or to try to deal with the public health issues that they're confronting. So there's a very active environmental justice community in South Africa um, that's really quite impressive and I think compares very well with the U.S. environmental justice community. Catch a train relatively soon, so yeah. Thinking about this as the what now portion of the evening, I know that I definitely feel indicted in this problem being a consumer of these goods that are using you know, minerals that are mined in these places, are there things that I can be doing kind of on the other end of the spectrum to make an impact, um, even something I can do tomorrow or tonight? Sure. Um, I think there's a lot you can do. Uh, we're trying, we're, we're going to um, uh, attempt to organize another tour from Barnard to South Africa. Uh, and we'd like for it to be an, another interdisciplinary um, tour so that we really do need, um, the kind of research you've seen today is, is incredible. And it's the kind of research that we really need to start making the argument with the South African government and other governments around the world about the dangers of vanadium and the dangers of mine um, uh, or exploring uh, gold mining. Um, so we need your research, first of all. So I hope that there will be a number of you who have, will become very passionate about this issue. Um, perhaps another senior thesis. Um, perhaps some of you would like to go to South Africa and continue this research. Um, there are legislative ideas that we have on the table from the No Fear Coalition. I'll leave some cards here if you're interested in talking to me a little bit later. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, when Diane and I organized a trip to South Africa, we had hoped um, that, um, that Barnett students would become active in this issue. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, I sort of came in from Maryland to support this activity because this is exactly what we were hoping would happen at Barnard that one or two or 10 or 20 students would begin to really feel very passionate about this issue and want to do something about it. And so if you're interested in working with my group, um, I would love to hear from you. Um, and, and I'd like just to tell you a couple of things that we've done, um, if I can, before I sort of have to, to go away. One of the things that we found out through our research was that when the men come in from the mines, and actually now women are mining, and we have absolutely no reproductive data. We have no idea uh, about the consequences of vanadium pentoxide exposure on, on women's reproductive health, none at all. Um, so one of the things that we found out was that the men were coming home uh, in these um, dust-drenched uniforms, and, the, and their wives were literally washing these, um, uh, these very toxic uh, uniforms with their bare hands. Uh, and they had oftentimes had babies on their back. And so we found one story where a baby had actually died from this telltale sign of vanadium poisoning with the green tongue. And so we began to put pressure on the mine to at least allow the men to take showers before they would leave um, the workplace and to also inform their wives as to how they could care for these uniforms in a safer way. I know it sounds like a really small thing, but we were able to get the mine to do that. And I think we've saved a lot of lives because of that. Um, 
And another thing that we've been able to do is to force the mind to now to send lit to we ask the minds to also provide literature to the wise of these men to let them know about their health risk uh, in relationship to exposure to men who are coming in with the negative pentoxide in their hair under their nails um, and and to make sure that children were not in the vicinity of the uniforms so I mean those are small things but we were able at least to push the, the corporation to provide that kind of public health service to, to the families. But we're still a long way from any real, uh, from addressing these important issues. So it's going to take a lot of public and particularly American um, activism to push back um, the American multinational corporations operating in South Africa and make sure that they're that they understand that as constituents, we're not going to buy their products as long as they're, um, as long as they're, um, uh, uh, as long as they're placing South African mine workers in this kind of uh, harm's way. So we need you to do that because union, whether it's I, whether it's Union Carbide, IBM, Ford Motor Company, there are a number of targets that we can sort of focus on, and those might be the focus of boycotts if we can organize enough people to really care about this issue. So thank you very much. Marsha has to head back to DC um, because she has to train right now. But if there are any other questions for Mariette, Uh, I'm overwhelmed with the issues uh, as it relates to mining in South Africa or mining anywhere. Um, but I'm also on the uh, on the side of of just being on the opposing side and and as, as a concerned citizen too. What happens to the economics if a mine closes and we have everybody in the community being supported by it? Um, it's hard for me to imagine that environmentally they're going to clean everything up and make it perfect, you know, in 24 hours and you can all go back to work tomorrow. So I see a, I'm being very pragmatic about this, not supporting not doing that, but I'm just wondering how we could really make that happen. I hope I have understood the question correctly. I first just want to mention that the entire mining industry is based on a model which is referred to as externalization of cost model. Uh, what happens during active mining is that the mine usually makes provision for the operational cost, that is the capital expenditure, and then on the balance sheet would appear, for example, the development cost, then it would also appear the profit. But what often is not put on a balance sheet are the non-internalized externalities. Those are the impacts or the costs of the mine closure. These costs are often carried when a mine is closed by community and also by uh, future generations and by a mute environment. So we do recognize the value of mining. We are not anti-mining. The, the Federation for the Sustainable Environment, for example, would, would encourage that the, uh, the cost that is the post-closed cost and impact also be internalized during the operation of a mine so that when a mine applies for a mining license or for a mining right or when it uh, uh, determines its viability or its feasibility, it has to include the lifetime of its impact. Those lifetime of impact may be hundreds of years or even thousands of years. So if they cannot make provision, financial provision, for these externalized costs, then a mining is not viable and should not commence. However, a mining can commence if they make provision, financial provision, for these impacts. I may just mention that Acid mine drainage, for example, is a typical non-internalized externality. Most of the mines have made no financial provision for the acid mine water that would flow or decant after mine closure. I, I hope I understood your question correctly. Do we have any other uh
I, um, just congratulations to the whole panel and particularly to Miriam. Um, but I just wanted to say that uh, um, maybe it's coming from outside of the sciences and, and other ways of gathering information. Um, I, I, and, and I think that uh, Marietta would know that um, women in particular in mining towns, uh, particularly, say, in, in those reef mining towns, the, the model reef mining town that was to be supposed to be the, the, the model of South African modernity was called Carltonville. Uh, mining, now Merifong Kutsong, um, where in 2005, 5,000 mine workers were laid off in one week, and then a month later, another couple of thousand were laid off. And the, the efforts by the women there were to create small industries. Um, and, and I think we get into the gendered issues here about men's work and women's work. And the women were used to providing and trying to make do for their families on the small wages that the men were bringing in. And women were trying to come up with ideas for market gardens, for bakeries. And these are small ways that they, they could feed themselves and maybe sell to others. And the men came up with an idea, mushroom farms. <laughs> in Mushroom farms in the, in the uh, uh, these are piecemeal ideas. Uh, mushroom farms in the abandoned mine shafts. But one that did take off and is, uh, is the rose farms, so massive rose farms. Um, Anglo Gold had the idea of creating a lion park because their symbol was a lion. Um, and I just didn't see how that was going to really create 5,000 jobs. But, but um, the, so, so there is that issue, I think, that um, other ways of looking, uh, go, going beyond um, the go looking to the government for, for statistics or the mines, looking to, look to the mines, the mine hospitals for statistics. I, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful organization in Mumbai called Pukar, and they have been creating in the, in the biggest slum in Mumbai what they call their barefoot researchers. And they're saying, empower the people who are living in these conditions. They know, they have the statistics. They know how many people have died, how many children have died this year. They know who's sick with what. And I'm wondering if that's where Barnard students may actually begin to do another kind of research and information gathering. Um, and and, and we, ha you haven't, we haven't even touched the, the issue of the informal minds what's going on in the abandoned mines, the Zamazamas, who are breaking through mine walls and who are also facilitating the, and speeding up the pollution. But you have just inspired me, Miriam, as you have in the time that I've worked with you, and I'm so proud to be associated with you in even the smallest way. Mariette, I think that's what we have time for this evening. I think that's what we have time for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we get a round of applause? You are, you are very welcome to join for wine and cheese in the adjacent room. Oh, do you have questions for me? Sorry. Margie. Hey, so I mentioned that I'm interested in the research that is not necessarily associated with science. Um, are there ways that you get mind safety for that are very informal mind safety or more specifically that you have in mind? You mean in the world? Yeah, yeah. Like best practices in the world? I mean, I know Minnesota probably has like issues similar to this. Um, in all honesty, I'm, that's not, I mean, that's not really my specialty. I don't really know. Um, I, I assume that there are better practices. So one of the things that I uh, pointed to in my slideshow was lime treatment, which is that really ugly, icky looking water. That was actually the better option of water. The, the more dangerous option is the one that didn't have any life in it, because once you treat it, lime, lime treatment um, means that the water can't leach or go grow further out, but if you put lime in it, it doesn't leach, it just stays that icky and contaminated and unusable water, but at least it doesn't then pose like a follow-up threat. Um, 
but in other places, so that in, in South Africa, that lime, lime sludge is like the best possible remediation. That's the utmost of the law. The mine has done their job and they can leave. In other parts of the world, there are higher standards for what needs to be remediated. But in all honesty, I'm, I'm not acquainted with them, unfortunately. What's your name? Sorry. I'm Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Well, all the research that you saw last night came from South African academics, um, except that one British spe specialist that I mentioned, uh, Chris Bugsby, the rest of it all came from South African academics. So that's not to say that South African academics are not doing research on this, but it is to say that there needs to be more research. So Mariette, um, who we just met, is also working in academia. She works at um, the University of Northwest, and she does. she's a specialist in water. And she works with a lot of other specialists who are starting to collect data on it, but it's it's pretty it's a pretty new it's a pretty new research field. So um, there needs to be more is really the message there. Other questions? Thank you all very much for coming to join me tonight.